I recently had one of our subscribers write in and ask me to do a review of a post that was made regarding estimating work using time. Oh boy. So this episode is going to focus on what this person, who or remain unnamed, uh, put out there regarding time and regarding estimation. It says story points your time estimating the work. Uh, this is an ongoing and endless discussion. Uh, I'm going to explain to you uh, how to use proper story point estimation versus how, why it's better to use time. And it, it just, let, let's pause here for a second. I want to point out that I did skim the article. So I a confession I did, and I saw how long it is. So I'm not going to go through each and every word in the article. But what I will tell you is they give a set of reasons to not use story points. So here they are. It says time is a universal unit of estimation for any product or project, regardless of industry. Story points are only closely related to software development. That's not true. Even if it's not suitable for all software, uh, it, as, of, as of such, it's not suitable for software development teams. And I think that that's a farce. I think if you properly know how to use story points, story points are a great tool, whether you're building software or not. And they go on to say, Successful implement implementation of using story points depends on several factors, including the proper environment, which means organizational culture that fosters an agile mindset. It becomes demotivating for a team to estimate in story points if leadership doesn't understand it and still expects strict time estimations. This is true. You want to make sure everyone's on the same page with how we're going to estimate and what we're going to estimate. Estimating in story points requires maturity and consensus. Eh, not really. I think that it requires people to get on the same page with a baseline. And once you get on a page with a baseline, it becomes much easier. We're going to talk about that in a minute. And then such a natural practice requires very knowledgeable and skilled scrum master coach to facilitate. This one, I will say initially, yes, after the first round, no. What I mean by that is if you have someone, and I'm just using myself as an example, who goes in and says, hey, this is what story points really are. Here's the proper way to use them. Here's an example. Let's let you walk through an exercise real quick and see if you can do it successfully. There's no reason why any scrum master or coach at any level couldn't step in and help the team understand how to properly leverage story points. I don't think it's that big of a stretch or that big of a grab. In fact, I think everyone is able to do it. It's just a matter of coordinating and trying to get people to understand proper use of it. So this particular author breaks it down into three things. The first topic that they discuss is estimating using ideal time, right? So when you start talking about ideal time, this is where all, teamers need, all team members need to understand that when we provide an estimate, they're asked to provide estimates in quote unquote ideal time. This is the time it takes to implement an item if that developer work Focus, if that developer can work in a focused environment without distraction, distraction means no checking emails, attending trainings, talking with colleagues, attending meetings, etc. Ideal time is actually different than real time. Ideal time refers to a time it takes to complete a specific task without interruptions um, or taking short breaks, watching videos on YouTube. I don't know why that was included, but okay. Real time accounts for the actual duration in calendar days or hours, including all distractions, stops, and interruptions. Let me pause here. I don't think ideal time is ever good. And the only reason I'm throwing it out there is my idea of ideal time, Swapnil's idea of ideal time, and Jane's idea of ideal time could be three completely different things. Uh, I tell people all the time when they say, oh, it's it's in ideal days. I'm like, okay, so my ideal day would be butt in sand, feet in water, drink in hand. So if I'm on a beach doing no work, that's an ideal day. So how many days on a beach would it take me to do this? And of course, people laugh, but that's my definition of ideal time. If you're talking about real time, are you trying to tell me that a junior developer is going to be able to estimate in real time just as accurately as a senior uh, architect will? And that if they do estimate using real time... Why would it take Joey one hour to do this when it would take Sam 15 hours to do this, right? Well, Sam's more junior. But still, if you flip the people on those, the numbers would switch. And then people would be really confused, right? My point is, it, it's no pun intended, it's just a lot easier for you to use T-shirt sizes, dog sizes, dinosaur sizes, anything but time. Because what I found is that people can get their head around the size factor of something. 
compared to everything else we're working on, is this bigger, is it smaller? What is the size factor? It's easier to get your head around that than it is to get your head around other methods of estimation. So if you're trying to do this, I think that you need to, by the way, I just want to make sure I point out, it's impossible to eliminate every distractive activity, period. You can't say we're not going to have any meetings, we're not going to have this, we're not going to have that. You're asking for an impossible situation for you to estimate. And anytime you're trying to create something impossible, I'm not sure that that's ideal, if that makes sense to you. So as far as I'm concerned, if you're ever going to get estimation correct, the first thing you need to do is get rid of time. The second example that they use is using the Fibonacci sequence for estimation. So she says the second rule related to the options of numbers team members have to provide their estimates is usually in a Fibonacci sequence or variance thereof. And this is where they do 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 20, etc. And it says that the small gap is only one, but the larger gap can be up to 20 differences. Okay, let's pause there. I never let teams get all the way up to 20, 40, 100. I, I just don't. I stop them at 13. The purpose for this is if I'm trying to get forecasting accuracy, I want only a small variance. In fact, most teams, I just say one, two, three, five, eight, that's it. And I tie it back to t-shirt sizes, extra small, small, medium, large, extra large. This way it's simple. The highest variation is three, which means that if somebody does make a grave mistake and say something's an eight when it's really something a lot smaller, there's not a huge number of points that you have to make up to, to fix whatever was broken or to fix a bad estimate. So it doesn't say, oh, we messed up on one estimate. We got to throw everything out and start over. It says, hey, we messed up on an estimate, but look at the value provided. Now, what if I can take that time or budget and apply it towards something else, right? The point I'm trying to make, once again, pun intended, is that anytime you start pulling time into this and try to associate time with points, I heard people say, oh, three to five story points is respectively three to five ideal days. Oh my, here we go again, right? What's an ideal day? Who's ideal day? Who's working on it? So if you say that one thing is a two and something else is a two because one person's working on it versus someone else, does that mean that it's different or is it still the same? I think you see where I'm going with this. It creates an environment where confusion prevails. So my rule for story points is I'll let you associate it with dinosaur sizes, dog sizes, books from the Bible sizes, mountain peak sizes, anything, anything, shoe sizes, t-shirt sizes, as long as it doesn't have to do with a number. Because the second you put a number on it, people are going to start associating that number with either time, money, or number of people needed to do something. And anytime you get to that point, you can count on one thing, your estimates are going to be wrong. Okay. Uh, number three, create a safe environment and use planning poker. Okay, let's pause there. Mike Cohn, I love you to death. You're my man. I absolutely adore you. But planning poker as it's logically sequenced out without incorporating t-shirt size into it and trying to make the numbers associate to something causes more confusion than anything else. And I found that so many people struggle because they're using numbers. You know, in leadership especially, the second you say, oh, it's a three, that, that leader's going to be like, three what? And then somebody's going to explain and say, you know, three, uh, uh, three is like a unit of unitless measures. So like, if you've got something that's a three, you got something like twice. So like, whoa, man, it'd be like a six. But there is no six. So I can decide whether it's five or an eight. And it's a book I want you to read. It's already bad, right? So how do we stop that from happening? What's well, simple. Use something easy. If you're trying to figure out size and we get everyone to agree on what a small is, then our sizing is consistent, regardless of who's working on it. Something does not increase in size because it would take longer to do. The example I like to give is painting a wall. The wall size, does, the wall size never changes. The wall size is exactly the same, but the skill set of the painter does vary, meaning it might take a junior painter longer to paint a medium-sized wall than it would take a senior painter to paint a medium-sized wall, but the size of the wall remained medium. If you can get to this point with your teams, what winds up happening is the teams collectively can figure out how many units they can paint. And then if you say a small wall has an equivalent of two, extra small is one, small is two, medium is three, large is five, and extra large is eight. If you can get there and you can say the team can do 20 units, that means they can paint 20 extra small walls or 10 small walls or you know, roughly seven medium walls, four large walls, or one narwhal. 
don't know why they want to paint a narwhal, but they could, you get the point. That, that's my narwhal joke. But, but what I'm trying to say is you need to look at this and say, okay, I'm going to stop trying to tie time back to things. And I'm going to start looking at this through a different lens. If you start looking through a different lens, what you'll find out is it doesn't matter what wall you start to least experience or most experienced painter on. If you start the least experienced painter on the hardest wall, then the most experienced painter is going to pound out all the easy walls and meet the least experienced painter on the hard wall. If you start out with the most experienced painter on a hard wall and the least experienced painter on an easy wall, they're going to meet somewhere in the middle. The point I'm trying to make is just, it's so much easier if you take time out of the equation. It makes it easier for the developers because they're not thinking in terms of time. It makes it easier for leadership because they have more accurate forecasting metrics. And it makes it so much easier for humans. And, and, and once again, I want to make sure I, I emphasize, our human mind is not designed very well when it comes to how long is something going to take. It's just one of those questions that we struggle with. But if I ask how big of a job is that, it's usually something that we can rally behind, get our head around, and we can usually get other people to agree because the size or scope of a project is a lot different than how long it's going to take. That's going to do it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have a question about this topic or any other topic, learn more at AgileDad.com. We'd love to hear from you. As always, we encourage you to stay healthy, stay well, and stay agile, my friends. Until next time, do take care.